this uh, series of uh, discussions and talks, uh, we are uh, very privileged uh, to be uh, joined uh, by, uh, I wouldn't be exaggerating to say, maybe the uh, global pioneer uh, in uh, relief and aid work and uh, uh, also NGO uh, organizations um, in, the, in the Muslim world. Uh, Dr. Hanan Benna, who has uh, dedicated his entire life to serving communities, not just local communities uh, in the places where he's been living, but uh, uh, quite literally around uh, the world. Uh, he established um, probably the most recognized uh, brand in relief work, Islamic relief worldwide, uh, as well as uh, been an inspiration uh, either behind the scenes for many people who then went on to do other things in other organizations or uh, has been an inspiration of other things that have been set up since uh, then, uh, both in terms of relief work within the Muslim community, the Muslim world, but also uh, even things with the United Nations and other uh, uh, institutions uh, around the world. So I'm not going to um, spend more time introducing him. I'm sure you're all aware of who he is and what he has done. Uh, and I want to get straight into uh, this discussion. So firstly, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hani, for, uh, for giving us the time. So we want to start off. Sorry, it's okay. Yes, please start. So let's start off where we're here now uh, in probably a very unique Ramadan for all of us. None of us mm -hmm. have um, witnessed a Ramadan where we have been to some extent limited physically at least to what we can do um, or where we can go or who we can see. Um, but Ramadan has always been that month where we always look forward to, to try and recharge and recharge not just spiritually even from a psychological perspective or a physical perspective looking for that boost that will get us through at least a few more months uh, after that. Um, let's start with that. I mean what what was Ramadan for you as somebody who was building these organizations, serving these people around the world? Um, what did it mean to you? And then if you can reflect upon this current Ramadan as well. Okay, Alhamdulillah, Ustaz Samah, Astullah. Thank you very much for uh, asking me to be with you today. It's my duty, it's not a privilege. Uh, I was waiting uh, to share my experience, my knowledge with you. I think I never, experience Ramadan as just a month of uh, just fasting, praying, eating, visiting, socializing. On our Ramadan, especially when we started the humanitarian and development work 36, 37 years ago, was on the road. On the road, 24 seven, from day one to day 30 or at least day 25. In the good old days, when we were younger, at your age, we were younger than you, we used to go every night to be in a different mosque, or two mosques, or three mosques, or four mosques, at the time of Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. When we traveled in Ramadan, we used to have something called caravan tour. It starts on the day one of Ramadan, come back home on the day 28 of Ramadan, so our family never enjoyed my companionship or our companionship. While we are traveling on the road from Birmingham to Aberdeen and from Birmingham to London and south and southeast and center, those people on the caravan never enjoyed the companionship of their children and their family during the whole month of Ramadan. If we traveled abroad, if we used to travel abroad, like we go to Latin America to discover Latin America, to raise funds from there, or other countries, especially when we are Latin America, we come back after Eid. So we, we, we spend the Eid and Ramadan outside. Not socializing, but raising the fund, raising the awareness, and letting people to understand what is happening to the Muslim Ummah in Bosnia, in Kashmir, in uh, uh, Palestine, in Africa, in different parts of the world. This was our Ramadan. Besides that, we do the ritual prayer, the, 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 rich, the, the prayer itself, the qiyam al the fasting, and all these sort of things. But this kind of energy is unlimited in Ramadan. You find yourself having meetings before Fajr 
or after fajr, before tarawih or after tarawih, you find yourself doing dars to the people, especially when you go to minorities in different countries, you find yourself highly, highly, highly motivated and energetic and you want to, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make Ramadan 365 days. This is the power of Ramadan when you are in Ramadan geared for the common cause for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save the ummah itself. The Ramadan today, or and this, this Ramadan is unique, but is not unique for me. The only thing is the restriction of the movement. Don't, uh, what, what I'm trying to say, for you young men and young women, don't ever take no for an answer. No has a yes, and yes has a yes, and success has achievement. And succeed, achievement has an excellence. And excellence has, is, an, is, a, is a never ending story. Never ever, never ever, never ever say that the corona will beat us. No way. Never ever and never ever say that the, the corona or any virus will let you to be depressed, isolated, and not, doing, not being able to do our duty. This month, we should communicate more and more and more and more because we have a lot of time in our hands to reflect with that distraction. Our time to reflect with anybody and everybody, with our families, with our friends, with our brothers, with our sisters, with our neighbors, with the social media and with actually the telecommunication and technology, we can, we can connect to China, to America, to Sweden, North Pole or South Pole within seconds. So really, we have no excuse we have no excuse of working harder to reflect our Imam. The, the more hard we work, the more we will show our, our Allah SWT how Iman is deeply entrenched in our heart. The less work we do with this Ramadan or outside Ramadan, this reflects the weakness of our Iman and the distraction of ourselves from the main cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How so can I, we? Yes. I, if you don't mind, I want to ask you and pick up on this point, uh, Dr. Hani. Okay. You, you mentioned something very important. You said uh, there should be no no. Nobody should take no for an answer. And that we don't have any excuse right now because of all the different um, means that we have accessible to us in terms of technology and so forth. When you established Islamic Relief uh, almost 40 years ago, there wasn't uh, the internet in, as freely available as it is now. There wasn't mobile phones. If you wanted to have a meeting, you would have to get in a car and go a few hundred miles to meet somebody else to set up something. You couldn't set these lectures up uh, you know, with a click of a finger. Yet, my feeling is that what was achieved 30 years ago, 40 years ago, is far greater than what is being achieved now by us. Even though right now we have so much more at our hands. Why is that? Uh, in the good old days, as you said rightly, we used to depend on the drive of our Iman. We used to walk in the rain, under the sun. We used to be uh, called names. We used to be pushed outside the mosques, because fundraising from a mosque at the time was something uh, stra strange for them. We used to be suspected, because we are actually doing something strange. People never used to see it before. Who can stand and talk about Africa in the 80s, or about Zakat, or something like that? We were depending on what we believe in. We were depending on our hearts, on our vision, and on our drive of the love of Allah and the fellowship of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't have no resources. We have to be creative of making resources from nothing. And this is why we, we, we developed something some time ago in the 80s. A penny a day keep a famine away. Not an apple a day keep a famine away. And we're calculating, if we raise one penny, our, our, our aim is to raise one penny from the whole Ummah. It will become hundreds of millions of pounds at the end of the year. This was our drive. While we were, have nothing, you see, you know, when we had our first computer in 1986, 
it was like a, a celebration. I was standing, used to stand next to it in a very small room and say, we have a computer. Allahu Akbar, we have a computer. Allah, and we even did not know how to use a computer. We used to write things by hand. We used to write all the donations, five pound, 10 pound, 20 pound, 30 pound, London, Bradford, and all these sorts of things. We used to stay from during Ramadan till after Tarawih in the office. Whoever was writing these checks and the, the recording it for five or six weeks to analyze it and to record it manually. Because we have the message, because we have what the, the mission, that's just what I'm trying to say. Because each and every one of us had a mission at the time. I'm not sure if the people nowadays still having this mission or not. We are depending on technology, but we are not depending on this. We are connecting to the technology of the man, but we are not the connecting with the technology of Allah, which goes from the heart to the mind, to the soul, to the angel, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he can connect us to every and each one on earth, to all the creations of Allah, to help us here and there. This is why you people nowadays, uh, the brother Jamal, mostly depend on technology, which is good. But I want my young people to depend on what's in the Allah, then depend on the technology. And this is the difference. The difference that actually we used to walk, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't have uh, cars, we used to take the bus, we used to go from mosque to a mosque to take a lift from somebody who has a car at that time. And this is the beauty of the 80s. So I want to I want to pick up on this, and I I, I if you allow me to um, share some thoughts here, and, and I want you to to maybe take these a bit further. I, I saw growing up um, that there was a, a gradual erosion of um, of how this this psychological this psyche worked. As you said, you said back then there was a belief that you had to do something. You, there was that connection, a spiritual one, that would be translated into action. Gradually, there became arguments of, okay, people should just focus on their ibadah, or there was arguments of uh, it's irrelevant about the um, how connected you are spiritually with your Lord. You should you you can do whatever you want that is good, so long as I'm doing something that's good. It's irrelevant how uh, uh, how much I'm taking care of myself spiritually. And what ended up happening is you ended up either having people who uh, would not get involved in anything that was f f beyond the, the, the four walls of the, of the masjid, or you had those who were getting involved in some stuff but wouldn't enter those four walls of the masjid. And in that, there is a dilution of everything. So is there an argument here for you to talk about how important it is to have that holistic approach to everything? And how important is the community work how important is it to have a spiritual background for the community work and how important is it to have a community background for the spiritual work? So, ibadah is action, is a delivery of service. Ibadah is action and delivery of service to the community. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abdullah ibn Abbas entered the house, the mosque of the Prophet Sallallahu in, uh, in Medina and he found somebody making Qiyam al during Ramadan. And he told him, and this, in this hadith, to go outside, to take care of your fellow brother or fellow sister is far more better than standing in the mosque for a month or two or three. Here is the ibadah. In Surah Al-Hajj, Allah said, O oh, believers, Kneel down, make sujoon, and make ibadah. Ibadah is comprehensive. It's not just the prayer and the fasting and the zakat and the hajj. Ibadah is community service where Prophet ﷺ before Islam was doing it. So when Jibreel ﷺ was revealing Quran upon him and they came back to his wife, and he was trembling in fear, 
and she told him what? Wallahi inna Allah lan yukhzika abadan with the name of Allah, Allah would never let you die. Because you were abid to Allah before he became a prophet. What was he doing? Tahmil al-kalb, to support the weak, to visit your relatives, to empower the poor, and to help everybody. This was the community action, the community action in the address of Khadija to the Prophet Sallallahu is for the community. And I, I tell you something, Prophet Sallallahu said, Al-Muslim, al-ladhi yukhalit al-nas, wasbir ala adham, khayrun min al-ladhi la yukhalit al-nas, wa la yathbir ala adham. The Muslims who mix with the people, who make da'wah to the people, who help the people, who look after the care or the welfare of the people far more better than the Muslim who sit at home and does not mix, whether she or he. And this is Ibadah. Ibadah when you eat, Brother Jamal, and say, Bismillah rahman rahim I'm going to have my meal to have a, a strong physique to be able to help my brothers and sisters or fellow or humanity. Their food becomes an Ibadah. Your drink becomes an Ibadah. Even your relationship with your wife to protect yourself from doing something haram becomes Ibadah. Your ilm, your knowledge becomes Ibadah when you share it with others. Ibadah is not something to keep saying tasbih. Yes, I need to say tasbih. Yes, I need to read Quran. I need to do all these sort of things. But I need the most important part of our life is Ibadah through saving community and saving humanity. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ was caring about saying, you know what he was saying? Ummati, 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 Ummati. Ummati in action. Ummati in da'wah. Ummati in delivery. Ummati in love. Ummati in care. Ummati in saving. Ummati in all this passion and emotion, feeling inside the heart of the Prophet ﷺ that he wanted to save humanity. That's why when, the, when this Janaza uh, uh, of this uh, a non-Muslim man was a Jew or something like this was passing by him. I was so upset because this is a soul that I missed here to be saved to be in, in, in heaven with Allah. This is the worship of the Prophet Sallallahu as ibadah. Prophet Sallallahu used to stand up night every night for hours and hours and hours. Is that right? But during the whole days, there's the action. There's the whole days. There's action by him. The people who travel to teach, the people who travel to make jihad in Sabiyah Allah SWT, all of these are ibadah. But once we switch the intention, if we start switching our intention, our intention will change anything into an action of ibadah. And will take us from being abd of Allah SWT as slaves and to become abd as worshippers of Allah SWT. But all of us are worshippers, but all of us are abid, including Muslims and non-Muslims, including animals and non-animals. Not many of us become a bad. A bad when we submit ourselves, our, our souls, our, our life totally to Allah SWT. And this is the ibadah. The ibadah when you deliver what people need from you. Ibadah when you draw a smile on the face of your child, on the face of a woman. When you serve people, look at the people coming to, 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 to Greece. The, 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 the dying or the drowning children, the frozen children of Syria in, in, in Lebanon, and the, the, the horror happened to the Yemeni, all of this. Our ibadah here is to save, to help, to promote, to advocate for their cause, beside the ritual ibadah that we are having. I think when we, to be very honest, when we, that's, that's why, that, no, I'm, 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 I remember something else. You know why the Prophet ﷺ said, Allah mahshurni ma'al masakin. He loved them. He served them. He was dreaming to change them from the state of maskeen to the state of a better state. Ahlul Sufa. You see, all those kind of people, actually, the, this was the, the, the main aim of the Prophet ﷺ to, to, to have his ibadah comprehensive. Ibadah is not in a room, not only in a mosque, it's not only in the Quran, this is a part of ibadah. But the, the part of that to be added to, uh, these are the pillars of Islam. 
to be added to what I am going to do to the community. See, the more we mix with people, Brother Jamal, the more our Iman will be deeply entrenched in our heart, will be far diverse and multi-dimensional that we can ever think. I want to, I want to, sorry, sorry, Doctor, I, I want to ask you something now, and I think that point is, uh, mashallah, you've made it very clear in that the, you know, the, the, the multi uh, dimensional aspect of Ibadah that it's not just from that perspective and I think that is something that I wanted to start off with as a, as a foundation. I want to ask you now something practical, okay? Uh, you at a point in your life decided that you wanted to do something, right? You decided that khalas, you, were, you had an idea, that you had a mission and you were going to make that a reality. And if I'm not mistaken, if I remember, you started off with 20 pence or one pound or something was the first donation from a young child in, uh, in, uh, uh, who was going to buy something with it. Uh, I remember this story. I ask you this to, to I ask this to say, to ask, to, to say something else here. You are now have, there's 20, 30, 40 people here in this uh, seminar and each of us knows people and so forth. I'm sure each and every one of us would like to change the world one way or the other. But I'm also sure, starting with myself, that that like to change the world hasn't really gone beyond some thoughts at night, maybe, or maybe some discussions with my friends, right? Right now, there really is that need for people like you to actually decide to say, you know what, I'm actually going to make it a reality. Yani, share with us, please, what made you able to say, you know what, I'm going to make this real. I'm going to set up a charity. I'm going to go to Sudan and then to the rest of the world and provide relief for millions and millions of people. I'm going to start accessing the potential of the Muslim community and start diverting funds to make the lives of people who uh, would otherwise be a lot more miserable, less miserable. What is it that can make people go from feeling that frustration, from feeling that hopelessness in the condition that we are in now, to actually being empowered and to do something? Okay, thank you, Zakallah. First of all, in the 80s, I never had any vision, any strategy, nothing. We found as simple as that, brothers and sisters. Or actually watching tonight. We found there's a need for people in Africa for us to help them. Very simple, extremely simple. Okay? We said, let us do something. What is this something? We wrote some appeals on pieces of paper. We used to distribute it from door to door. We used to walk it from door to door, from shop to shop, from mosque to mosque and everywhere that's it and when the fund came from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because one of my colleagues who started it with me at that time he was so pure his heart is extremely incredible hundred times better than myself and others allah accepted our intention with this legging from door to door, to street to street, to mosque to mosque, all this. We start to be happy with the pennies. You know what the first donors in the UK, the best donors in the UK, the frontline pensioner, unemployed, and elderly used to empty their pockets, giving us these pennies, and half a penny, and uh, two pennies. And we used, to be, we used to be very happy of what Allah is giving us. This is how we started. We started to be, uh, uh, what do you call it, to focus on our objective. We used to have say something to say that help the Muslim refugees in Africa as a song. And we, sang it with, we used to sing it with the children at the time. And we used to have this uh, plastic donation boxes in the summer camps, help the Muslim refugees in Africa. And that's how we started. We never knew. We didn't have an office, Brother Jamal. We didn't have a telephone. We didn't have a desk. We only had my brother Hassan and myself and others who had that want to help. Even we did not know what vision means. Even we don't know what strategy means. Even we don't know what management means. We did not know all this. But actually what we know, 
what we knew is that we want to do something simple and continuous. The most beloved act before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the continuous, even if it's that. This is how we started at, 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 at that time. So we were surrounding ourselves by youth, and this is a spirit. Don't ever undermine the youth. Most of the volunteers in the, until 85, 86, 87, and 90 were secondary school students and university students. They were the power to ignite our hearts and we were the engine to motivate them. It was this kind between us, I was in the mid 30s at that time, and they were with us. And this action, no resources. But really, when we the money, alhamdulillah, from Allah came to us. We used to make sujood if we receive any amount of money. Even after now, see if we receive some good news, before we announce it, we, we, even when we are talking to another on the phone, okay, say, brothers, go down to Allah, make sujood, and leave the telephone on, and when you, walk, you, you stand up, go back and carry on the conversation. Because the, the decision has been made, because the donation has been given, the, there is a contact, and this is the connectivity. Then we started to learn, okay, uh, policy, strategy, structure, employment, and all these uh, 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 tools to, to enable us to, to build an organization. But we did not go there as highly qualified, literate individuals who are professional in management. I am one of the, if I tell you about myself, I was one, I am one of the worst managers, as most of my colleagues and my brothers are talking about myself. I used to treat people badly, but because they knew that I did not mean to hurt them, I was focusing on the bigger picture, and sometimes I step on your feet, they forgive me. I never work with anybody, and everybody يعني, feel that I am a saint, I am a holy man. No, I do a lot of mistakes. And we do a lot of mistakes because we are human beings. But let us, after doing our mistakes, go back, go back, go back and correct these mistakes and learn from our mistakes. That's why the, 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 the movement, of the humanitarian movement, which started in 1984, is now, it was one organization. At that time, it became 100 plus humanitarian organization in the UK. And this leading movement. But now, you know, if you ask me this question, Brother Jamal and the other brother, Haji and others, what else do we need to do? The social movement. We want to excel in the humanitarian movement because we are masters, because we are leaders, and because we, people should follow our way, because our way is one of the best ways. But what we need to do as well, is social movement. When we look after the infrastructure of the civil society or the civilians that are living amongst them, like nowadays. Nowadays, what's happening in the whole world is not just humanitarian, it's social. When you look at the elderly, the homeless, the widows, the divorcees, the children and the animals, the birds, the climate, all this kind of thing, which we need to actually to let our community, especially you, younger generation, because to, to, to look after it. Because you know why, you know, you know why, uh, Brother Jamal? Because the humanitarian movement, for me, is not difficult. It's based on emotional reaction. But social movement is a back-breaking. Social movement is empowerment, is advocacy, is community building, is all this protection of the rights of people. So Alhamdulillah, over the last 25, over the, over, over the last, over, um, over, over the first 25 years, we knew the art of the material movement. And we can teach now. That's why my appeal to the people with you, uh, bro, bro, Brother Jamal, is try to develop your own theory. Try to develop your own terminology. Try to develop your own vision and let others to follow you. I can learn from others, but I have to produce my ideology. I have to produce my ideas. I have to create my culture 
I have to change the culture and at least and have this kind of, this kind of competition or actually between the cultures and see who can follow this culture and, and this culture. We actually at that time as we speak in Ramadan to think about how to not only be led to save humanity, but when we lead to save humanity and learn from others. This is the, the, the roadmap over the last 35 years. Now, when we look at uh, uh, all the problems affecting us globally, whether this climate change, the cause of climate change was actually HIV AIDS, and the cause of HIV AIDS, and all this pandemic and the epidemics which come to kill people, the war, the, the conflicts have been created, the displacement, the, the refugees, and the movement of refugees, the, the migrant refugees, and all these sorts of things. We have a responsibility. Abada is to keep building several such organizations, to, to keep building several sectors, and to keep building personality, keep building personality and they invest in the individual, Abada as well, when we empower our young uh, brothers and our young sisters are made to be a part of our decision maker inside our organization. I'm going to, uh, I'm getting a few questions from, uh, from the participants. Just before I start asking them, I want to ask one last thing and then I'm going to open, uh, I start to, uh, yes, yes. Um, um, so I want, want to start, just one thing I want to ask is this, uh, you've made it, you put it very clearly about, um, the importance to start looking at um, advocacy work, to start looking at community building, to start looking beyond the um, one-dimensional humanitarian relief work, but also the need to fill a vacuum. There is a vacuum. Uh, the Muslim community in many countries around the world um, has a huge vacuum. It doesn't have, it's not in control of anything really, where we are always the recipients of aid or where the recipients of political decisions that are made on our behalf or even against us and so forth. There is no um, empowerment whatsoever on any level. We don't have leadership. We don't have visionaries. We don't have those who uh, protect our interests uh, or those who can plan for our coming generations. Um, how do you think we can start filling that vacuum? How do we fill that vacuum, the leadership vacuum, the empowerment vacuum, what's needed for that? And more importantly, when I say these words, it seems like such a big thing, right? We don't have this. We're very weak. We're very divided and so forth. So the easiest thing is for me or anybody here to say, oh, that's beyond me. I can't do it. I can't do anything about that. Is that true? Nothing is impossible. It's impossible to think that something is impossible. This, I think Nelson Mandela mentioned something like this. There's no life with despair, and there's no despair in our life. This is number one. Number two, if we're going to talk about, uh, just uh, remind me about the question again. Uh, the, the vacuum that exists the vacuum, in terms of... The vacuum, okay, I remember that. There's, there's two kinds of leadership. There's collective leadership, which we need desperately, and there's individual leadership. People in our world who are in charge of humanitarian and social organization are extremely traditional. It's not haram. We have to bless what they have done. But now, some of us become out of date. This one who can bring governance. Please, brothers, you can't be of Mr. Mr. who knows nothing to, uh, to, to, to manage a big organization. You have to have this kind of successive plan of a, uh, to, to, to build new leadership from within the organization. The collective leadership comes from where? From letting people to believe in that we cannot do it alone, that one organization. We need to get used to terminology called collaboration, cooperation, partnership. And this is a killer inside our organization. As you know, uh, Brother uh, Jamal, uh, since I left Islamic Leaf 12 years ago, I left it for another reason, because I thought that actually my role in the humanitarian work is, is finished. Let us do something as needed. So we did the humanitarian forum, and we did the Muslim Chess Forum. Muslim Chess Forum, after 12 years, is still suffering 
of the cooperation between the leadership of the Muslim ch charity in UK. Because of the logo, because of the ego, because of the amount of money. It's not only in UK, it's globally. It's globally. The more we, people who listen, have money, the more they say, that, oh, yes, why should I talk to you? I used to receive phone calls from people in different organizations to come and beg me to help them. Nowadays, they turn them back to me because they have the millions. And this is, this is actually collaboration, cooperation, networking, and communication, and building partnership. If this is what we need to, 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 to have a, a collective leadership. But if you want to, to build the individual leadership, you have to start with the young people. No doubt. Volunteerism. Bring the volunteers and let them to be brought up in the organization and let the, let, let the role model of the organization to help them and to become a real role model. So if we have in our organization younger generation, male and female, and I'm very adamant about, about just clarifying M and F, male and female, we are in a safer place, but when they are there, we don't use to we don't use them as window dressing. Oh yes, we have some children. Oh yes, we have some women. Oh yes, we have some girls. No, it's not a window dressing. I'm not going to use a woman or a young girl as a window dressing. I'm going to use her as a leader for the future. When I'm there to teach, when I was started our work, my work, sorry, as a medical doctor in Abrestos in in UK. This was, I came to Abrestos in the end of 1978, okay? Say about 79. I used to go to the world round. You know when the consultant or the professor come to the world round, he used to point to the medical student, which is the youngest and the, and the least experienced individual in the, in, in, in the room, to the sisters, staff nurse, nurses, auxiliary, doctors, registrar, senior registrar and consultant, this is your duty. Look after him. Because he invest, he's investing in the younger doctor to become a professor in the future. If we don't invest in younger generation while we are there, we'll never have future leadership. And this is a challenge. Look at the boards of our organization. Look at the, the representation of our organization. The senior, the senior, the senior people who are running the organization. You find them at my age, or maybe older than me, or maybe less, uh, less older than me. So there's a collective leadership, which we need it. And in collective leadership, you have to, as an individual uh, organization, forget about your logo, forget about your ego, forget about your soul. Yes, all our logos are the same. So what? So what? Your logo and your ego are going to take to heaven. So we put all the logos equal. And this is my belief, collective leadership by accepting to give some of my rights to the right of my fellow organization and investing in the young people. The third one is to make volunteerism as a philosophy for our culture and a philosophy for our life. Otherwise, no leadership will be there. Okay, I want to start uh, putting some of the questions that have been coming from the participants. Um, and then after that, I see there is a participant here that I'd like to get involved uh, in the discussion later on. Uh, but first, let me ask you first uh, with these questions. One question says, Dr. Hani mentions mistakes uh, that were done in the early days of Islamic relief. What mistakes does he feel were made in the early days? Um, uh, that he and others in Islamic Relief have learned from and could be a source of advice for us now? Let me talk about my mistakes. In the good old days, I, I, alhamdulillah, I, I, I had a very strong personality. Okay, I'm not sure if you are knew that. And sometimes, at that time, at the very beginning, in the late 80s and the beginning of the 90s, we didn't have a strong financial department at that time, because we are still on the move to build the structure of the organization. And I was overspending the fund here and there and here and there. Then we find all of a sudden, 1995, this was my mistake. I'm just saying it, I mentioned it many times. And I was ashamed of what I've done, 
but alhamdulillah it was corrected. Overspending without understanding because they don't have a, a strong financial and accounting department inside the organization. We find ourselves in a very financial, in a deep financial crisis, particularly at that time, one or two donors from the Gulf switched off their donation on us because they want, they, are, they are actually treated one of ourselves badly and they told them, I'm not going to deal with you unless you uh, uh, treat this individual rightly. They refused to actually, what two shortage of fund? Fund from a donor, which was going to be about nearly, nearly a million mark at the time, and the other fund which offered spending on my side. It was crisis. Crisis, which I it, it actually because of my mistake, because we did not have this strong department in the organization. We sat down. We did not panic. Never panic. If you panic, you will never a, be able to sort the problem out. What to do? I said we have to keep the headquarters because if there's some shaking in the headquarter, actually, this actually the organization will collapse. What to do? We to, uh, spoke to all the country directors. They said we have saving. We can stand up this problem for a few months because we have saving, then you can pay us later on. Then we started to think seriously about building a strong financial department and the accounting department. And Harun Atalla came, he is qualified finance, uh, uh, finance. And I told him, Harun, he said, What? That you make a strategic reserve. Don't ever talk to me about it and tell me. It took us about at least six months to tighten our belt, to cool our nerves, to fundraise ag aggressively. And after the six months, we started to take a deep breath, alhamdulillah. Then within a year or two, Harun was, put, was telling me that's about, about three or four million pound in the uh, strategic reserve of the organization. But this was done because people trusted me blindly. People did not question me, which is wrong. And there was no proper board of management to try to control my activity as a founder or as a CEO or a managing director at that time. This is one of the mistakes I keep saying to everybody. No matter who is he or who is she as a founder, she has to be observed, she has to be guided, he has to be observed and guided and told this is wrong and right. And, has to, and he or she has to be surrounded by brains. Don't surround the founder by clowns. That's what we found nowadays. Some founders, which were called founder syndrome, bring some clowns around him or her to keep himself or herself in the position for as long as they were. was a mistake, which was nearly going to close down the organization. But alhamdulillah, was all, you know why? Well, I'm just finishing in a few seconds. Because most of the people, at that time, were people of mission. They were not working for the salary. And sometimes the salary was few hundred dollars a month, not like nowadays. And used to work for, from, from eight o'clock to eight o'clock and more, because they enjoyed the love of service and delivering the service to the people they love. Okay, okay. Um, I have a question here who asked me, uh, or asks you rather actually, uh, if you are to start uh, charity work and community engagement today from scratch, what are the most important three, he's just giving three, huh? Uh, things uh, to do. First of all, I have to focus on my objective. Don't jump and bump and say that I'm going to save the whole world. Focus objectively on what you want to do. At that time, we said, we want to help the refugees. So help the refugees, that's it. Number two is to have this kind of belief in what you are doing. If we don't believe in what we are doing, what we are talking, we are just a, a singer or dancer. Number three is keep yourself with the community 24-7. Number four, believe in the youth. Wallahi, 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 the youth were actually the engine behind our success from the 80s to the late 90s. 
Number five, don't ever talk about resources, big resources. Take whatever it comes to you, but use it properly. Use it properly. And feel that whatever you spend on salaries or administration is a part of the money should be going to the poor and the needy and the displaced and the refugees and the sick and the widows and the orphans. Number six, from the very beginning, you know what? Tell everybody who is your employer. They will tell you, the board of management, the board of trustees, the CEO, the president. No, the employer who employs us are the poor because the money we have is their money, not our money. And you take some part of our money to spend it on ourselves and our family and to leave the rest for them. So whenever we take our admin from the money, we have to be careful of not overtaking huh? and depriving many of them of having the ability to have facilities by this money. So my employer from day one, and our employer from day one, is this miserably looking young child or barefoot, rotten clothes, running nose, sticky eyes. He or she are the people who stand or stand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what? Tell them Allah. Don't take Hani al-Banna to hellfire. Don't take Jamal to hellfire. He brought some, he drew a smile on my face. He brought some cake for me and Aid for any other day. If we know that we are employees of the poor, employees of the victims of war, employees of the raped women and children of Bosnia, which we forgot about them, this year, Brother Jamal, on 9 to 12, to 9 to 11 of July is the 25th anniversary of Srebrenica massacre. Tell me, anybody remember the Srebrenica? Anybody remember the, 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 the multiplicity of organized rape, government organized rape on our sisters and daughters in Bosnia in the 90s? No, we forgot about it. Who are busy. This is not the first time to happen to us as a Muslims in Bosnia. It happened too in the Second World War when, when Germany was defeated. Half a million women in Germany went to the doctor. They wanted to have suicide because they knew what the armies would be doing to them when they come to Germany. And there was more than two million women were raped. When I remember this, my sisters from Germany, my heart is aching. My eyes is blaring because I cannot see the scene that's happening actually at that time. But whenever we see this, we come back to the reality that we are the servant of our masters. And our masters are those, the people who serve, who, 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 who claim that we serve. That's a, it's a very um, uh, sobering reminder. And I think a lot of the times with the work that we do or that we try and do, sometimes we uh, feel subconscious self-importance that maybe we are actually doing something uh, in that regard that is um, as if we're doing it for somebody, we're doing a favor when actually all really that we are trying to do is find a way to um, save our own souls maybe um, from, from, you know, from, from, yeah, be it in this in in this world or the next. I want to. There is a question here uh, that I'm gonna. I want to bring in. I see we have Uthman Mukbil, who's uh, also Ooh. one of the uh, pioneers. Give him the platform. Give him the platform. Yeah. He's one of those I, I believe who who takes who took some of the part of the flag from you. Yeah, you're not the whole flag, but uh, is one of one of uh, those students of yours. Uh, no, 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 no. He's one of my colleagues. Correct yourself. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Oh, you know, I, will leave, I will leave him to correct it, I'm sure. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's one of my colleagues, not, not a student. Uh, Uthman, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uthman is, um, he was the CEO of uh, uh, Human Appeal. He's now CEO of Syria Relief, it's called, sah? Yes. Yeah, yes. 
Um, and he's somebody who I've, I, I also would learned a lot from uh, in my younger years. Um, and there's a question here that I want to put to you and Dr. Hani together, if you don't mind. It says, um, sorry, let me scroll up because a couple more questions have come since then. What is the future? What is the future of Muslims in the UK post COVID-19, post, post coronavirus? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? And what should we do? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, Asman, Asman. Bismillah. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Ramadan Kareem. Sorry, Dr. Hani, you are our ustaz and will continue and you will not forget that, inshallah. So, uh, just to answer your question, uh, Brother Jamal, uh, every disaster or every, let us say, uh, problem like this corona now it has two faces it has the danger face and it has the opportunity face so i think we need to look at the opportunity as we always look at the other side of uh, the corona and we always optimistic that in each issue like this we will find many many uh, opportunities that we can benefit from and we have to utilize during the crisis and after the crisis. And I am, as always, I'm very optimistic that we will benefit from the other side of this crisis and we will be stronger because we learn, I think, a lot of things during this crisis. We learned things which I think, like myself, uh, I don't remember once I prayed taraweeh, for example, at home. I don't remember at all. This is the first time. But when now I pray taraweeh at home with the family, I have iftar with the family, I really learned and took, learned a lot of new things about the family, about the children, about the kids, different life. How taraweeh is really can be prayed at home with different taste. So this is another opportunity. It comes to this small example. So if you go to a bigger example, we seen, I think this time that the Muslim charities, which always don't come together, they came together somehow to work, to help and support the community. And as you know, Dr. Hani, since he left officially Islamic Relief, he has been trying to work to unite the Muslim charities and the Muslim organizations to work together. So during this crisis, it really worked very well that people working together people working together towards support the community, not only the Muslim community, but even the wider uh, community. The future, Allahu A'lam, we cannot speak about the future, but I think uh, definitely I'm optimistic and we will utilize this crisis for better future for Muslims in, in the UK. Uh, Dr. Hanan, you have something? With yes, uh, let, me, let me say something about it. To complete, complete so to complement what the brother uh, Doctor Doctor Aslam Mokbel uh, started, it. whoever think that we will be the same as we were before Corona, he is out of his mind, out of space, out of everything. Things would be different totally. Working from home might be the priority. Going back. Uh, social distances might be the norm after that. Now we are using it because Corona is there, but might be a law. Checking our temperature when we come to the to do the shopping in the supermarkets might be another norm. Even in the supermarket that we are doing, this social distances inside the university between the students and between the uh, workers in the factory, in the schools, have to be there. Laws will be different. The people who understand the technology and will be able to use the technology and the new apps will be surviving. People like myself might not be, will be out of touch. Things will be different. Countries might be sinking and countries might be rising. People might do through the 3D printing at home what they need. That's why we need 
to learn and to educate our children and our community there to be able to use the technology. I think nowadays, globally, Muslims have been seen as a major and effective part in the greater community. From Canada, when uh, the Prime Minister was praising Muslims, Prince Charles and others, and, 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 and everywhere, they realized that we have some added value in our values, in our morality, in our manner, even in our cleanliness, and in our contribution. How many Muslim doctors died as shaheed of corona in UK? And Muslim nurses, more than 12 or 14 or 15. Consultants and professors and young ones. They did not die because they wanted some more money. They, want, they died because they were actually doing our, their duties to try to help and save others. This has been seen effective. This will be the key to lock the door of the Islamophobe and Islamophobia and tell them you are a part of evil. You are not a part of our British society. You are not a part of our global society. You are not a part of, of, of the human society. You are a part of the evil society. But change religion into fear and terror and war. Look at what happened now globally. Terrorist activity became less. Muslims are not terrorists. Because there's somebody financing the terrorist group to make terrorists and claim that Muslims are terrorists. Things become clearer. Our youngsters nowadays, their culture changed. And instead of dancing, bouncing, whatever it is, they think now that they are going to teach and preach and educate and serve and help our fellow brothers and sisters as youngsters. They started to become more meaningful, meaningful, to become more meaningful in their life. So a lot of things are happening and the technology and the research and the industry will be different. I'm, I'm just aware that I'm, I'm just aware that it's going to be Maghrib time in the UK soon. So I just want to to ask two very more quick things, if possible. Uh, one, there's a question from the audience which I'm going to ask at the end. But just before that, you you both mentioned something very important, and I want to uh, get some thoughts about this from both uh, Dr. Hani and Dr. Othman here. Um, Dr. Hani, you touched on the Islamophobia and how. Uh, the Muslims have been at the forefront of uh, trying to save people's lives in essentially a jihad of, 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 of uh, health work that was taking place uh, across the United Kingdom and many other countries as well. Uh, Othman, you, uh, you spoke also about uh, the uh, work of the different Muslim charities to unite in doing uh, things during Corona. But there seems to me that I am viewing ever since at least I left the United Kingdom and I'm viewing it from, from outside that we are very vulnerable. And by vulnerable, I'm not talking about the Islamophobia. I'm even talking about humanitarian organizations and charities. You're vulnerable that they're always demonized, that they come under attack, that they are vulnerable within themselves to infighting and so forth. Before we were talking about a vacuum of leadership, what I want to know about is post-corona, will we suddenly see that that vulnerability, because now everybody feels vulnerable, everybody can be hit by corona, everybody's been limited to what they can do. Will this provide an opportunity for us as a community to finally realize that we need to rise up and start providing for ourselves, start being able to lead our own education, to lead our own media, to lead our own economies, to start actually providing for ourselves rather than having small little pockets and dots here and there? I'm, I'm following you. Uh, Jamal, as I mentioned earlier, I'm optimistic. But in this point, I am not. And I hopefully I'm wrong. And Dr. Hani will correct me. Because uh, what you mentioned earlier, and I, Dr. Hani touched upon the point about the lack of leadership. So this is a problem. And I think we, we have, uh, we don't have the leadership that is able to be up to the job and up to the big challenges. And that sometimes we call them the state people. 
we unfortunately we don't have many we have very very few so this is number one number two uh, uh, the unity as well yani maybe now during the crisis there is some kind of of unity but when you don't have the right leadership you will not end up to have a, a, a very very let us say, say good unity that take us from this situation to different level or different stage so these are the two three things where i am really not that optimistic that we can do a lot of it and as you said now the media see us now these days that we are part of the community we are trying our best we are doing our best we have doctors we have nurses who became shaheed in the beginning yes there is some kind of positive media around the muslims uh, these days but at the same time uh, uh, we have issues internally and dr hani maybe can correct me that what you mentioned jamal about a few issues in the muslim organization that some of that let me say 50 60 percent of these issues are internal issues so before we blame islamophobia before we blame one two three so there is elements that they are within ourselves this is one secondly if you want to speak about the external factors definitely the government and the authorities are not now with the current government the conservative government in the uk is really is not that positive generally towards muslims and we heard a few a day a few days ago when they appointed one we know he is very islamophobic he is someone who is always attacking the muslims and the muslim community they put him in a position maybe you heard about this jamal put him in a position to review and to look at many things related to the muslim organizations and muslim community dr hani yeah let me uh, to complement what osman said before if osman is talking about the uh, long standing old big organization muslim charities and others i can agree with him because some of them reach it a momentum which is a cannot rise unfortunately because of the wealth of the organization but my optimism is in the eager or eagerness of the smaller ones who have to work on the small organization take them by the hand and most of the people come to to this campaign which is muslim chess forum organized during ramadan the majority of them were the most slim the smaller organization they want to learn they want to understand they want to connect they want to communicate the challenge we face here uh, brother jamal is financing we're still at the stage of the status quo that we don't donate money unless there is a disaster when we want to ask money for capacity building for research for uh, advocacy even the ordinary muslim donor does not give us money it's a problem here we need to tackle this I remember attending a meeting long uh, two two years ago, a new startup meeting with, if you remember, uh, Sir Stephen Bob, uh, brother uh, Osman, in his organization. From the very beginning, there was a businessman who donated all his money. You know what for Jamal and Osman, mm -hmm. for organization, for their income at the under hundred thousand pounds a month, uh, sorry a year, to build their capacity. We need some we need some donors like this to believe in the sector. We don't have. They always give money for your team, for orphans, for disasters, for killing, for displacement, and others. So why should we wait till people die or people become victim of rape? Then we give them some token of appreciation. What then to start the thing from the and this is what we need. Organization like the media. The media like Al Jazeera and others to be able to help letting the people understand what the value of building the civil society sector, which is one of the crucial elements of stabilizing the state. Governments come in office for a few years, business and businessmen would go up and down, but civil society sector is the pillar of the society 
and the pillar of the community and the pillar of the state. Just to add okay. one, one oh. point, Jamal, what Dr. Hani mentioned as well about the civil society. Uh, so you can see now the government, for example, in the UK, uh, pledged around 1 billion from the beginning of this corona crisis to support the civil society and the community-based organizations to take care of their local communities and to support and help the NHS in their localities. And this is the difference between the civil society in the UK and in the West generally and the civil society in the Arab countries. So one example of the Arab countries because Yani, I deal with my family there, so I, I understand what's happening. So the government, the government did not allow the, the organizations, the local organizations, the mosques, the charities, the civil society generally to do anything during this. You cannot move, you cannot. For, as you know, for different political reasons. So because they believe if now you help the needy, this will give you some kind of popularity when there is election or, as you know, this... Uh, mm -hmm. theory and so to prevent you to gain any kind while at this time you need everyone to help and support so this is the difference where you see the civil society in the west and uk as an example that the government is putting money to support the civil society to play its role during such a crisis mm -hmm. i know i'm very very you know you you need to go for to have a start so before you before you both leave and we conclude this um I, I just want to do a little plug here, obviously. There is a project that uh, some of the brothers uh, who are based in Qatar and also those uh, in other countries actually around the world are working on. It's called Hero Crowd. It is something we will be unveiling gradually over the next um, few months. Um, but it is uh, a project that was actually uh, came about in inception uh, as people were inspired by a talk given by Dr. Hani maybe about this time last year during Ramadan where he said that don't wait around. If you want to do something, you do it. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, uh, placed some barakah in these uh, brothers and they started working on it. And it's, it's, it's slowly getting there and will be seen. Um, but the idea about it is to actually develop and to merge between the aid and relief and the uh, community and advocacy and, and empowerment section. And to maybe be a cross section whereby all of these things meet to power the community to make everybody able to not just dream and think, okay, I would like to see uh, you know, my own small community better. I would like to uh, see a way whereby, for example, the curriculum in our schools uh, are dealt with in a more sensitive way, or I would like to, for example, get more social advocacy in politics here, or I would like some relief here or whatnot. No, you won't just dream about it. There will be some sort of a means and a method and a vessel based on the technology that Dr. Hani was talking about, obviously things in the future, particularly post COVID, will mostly be done even more so remotely and digitally. So do make sure that you keep your eyes peeled over the next few months, inshallah, for this. It will be an opportunity for everyone to get that empowerment that a lot of us, I know, at least I'm one who, it's something that you know keeps me up at night, how weak I feel generally. How uh, I, it's something very uh, degrading when you, go around the world and you see this status and the situation of many people around the world and how they're mistreated or how they don't have those basic rights yet. Alhamdulillah, we have been blessed to be able to have the iftar, to be able to uh, fast uh, for 30 days where they're fasting 365 days to practice what you want, but they don't. So inshallah, this will be something. I just want to ask Dr. Hani to summarize here, please, a call to action a call to action for people, whatever it is. I'm not asking for something mega. I'm not telling somebody go tomorrow and build a mosque or to go tomorrow and liberate Palestine or whatever, but go and do something. So what is that call to action? Uh, be objective, simple, and continuous. But if we structure an organization, yeah, suppose that we are structuring an organization and we register an organization in UK, or any part of the world. From day one, from day one, we have to build a parallel system of waqf to make it sustainable. To make two or three percent of the income of the organization kept for waqf. When I see that the Harvard University have about 40 billion dollar plus, I 
thank them and salute them. So the Oxford, the Cambridge, and the others, billions and billions of pounds of assets and uh, 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 wealth or endowment they have. So no matter what I have, I want you, the heroes, you're not going to be a hero or heroines because that's your name. No, the community will make you heroes and heroines because of your action. Go and visit. If you have a holiday and you have, alhamdulillah, stable income, go and stay two or three weeks or one or two weeks with the people where they are most in, in most in, in need uh, uh, in, uh, in the dire need to see the reality people like myself or Osman and others they, they have not been reformed because they were sitting in an office in London or in Paris or in Doha but because they have been visiting the field the best teacher for you to become hero heroes and heroine is the smile which comes from the back of the mind of the child to your face and you see him or her happy to be with you and this is this will be the first step of making you hero start very small project focus on an area if you want to work on on, on water you work on water if you want to work on agriculture work on agriculture if you want to work on more orphan and sponsorship, work on orphan sponsorship. If you want to work on education, education, whatever it is. But don't spread widely, spread thin, so the impact will not be there. And use the technology to let you to compensate for the lack of financial resources that you have. And let you to have the knowledge on your table before is actually as ex exactly that's what the in, 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 uh, in, in, in the meeting of Hazrat Sulaiman السلام, when he did not find the hubu bird, he said, where is he? And he talk about the throne of uh, Bilqis, uh, the queen of Sumer. And one good people like yourself, Afritum and Al-Jinn, like, uh, like Uthman, is Afritum is afri fundraising. Okay. He told him, I'll bring the, uh, the, the throne before the meeting is over. The one who has got the knowledge of the book of Allah SWT, the one who has the technology now. I bring it to you before you blink. Let you to use the technology to bring the good news before we blink. Master the technology, focus on the objective, be with the people, start small, build an endowment skill or waqf, as we call it. Thank you very much for your time, Dr. Hani, Dr. Uthman, everybody who joined in. I know, like I say, uh, Maghrib is uh, just a few minutes away uh, in the United Kingdom. So please do remember us all in your du'as when you break your fast. Um, like I say, please do keep a lookout uh, for uh, Hero Crowd and some of the stuff that will be coming over the next few weeks uh, and months. I'm sorry, there were a few questions, like I say, that people had asked. We didn't have time to ask them. Inshallah, we will be having other sessions similar to this uh, in the future. Um, and, uh, and I think that is it. I'd like to thank Hajji uh, Shahzad and others who put this together. Um, and bi'idhnillah, we will uh, end it here. So we'll just do dua. Al-Khatm, subhanakallahumma alhamdik, nashadu la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruk wa atubu ilayk. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر. جزاكم الله خير ورمضان مبارك. السلام عليكم.